So my plan is to kind of ask some questions about the making of and what brought you to it. Yeah. Um, and then I will geek out on my, I mean, every time I watch, the reason I love this movie so much, every time I watch it, I feel like I learn something new or figure something out. And I'm always like, oh, I wish I could just ask the writer. So I get to do that. Um, so I'll start with a really deep and hard one. Great. Who would win in a fight between you and you? I don't know. I don't know. I love that one. Yeah, that's a, great that's a good one. one. Um, so before I forget, does Mike say M is Karen the is Karen going to understudy your life now? Does he say something like that? Yeah, it's it's a callback as if she told that story also in this reality at the end. Okay. He's saying, is Catherine Maris going to understudy Catherine your life Maris, right, right. while you're in Vietnam? Because in the it. difference is in this reality, she said yes to Kevin to go on that trip. Got it, got it. Okay. And, this, and so the whole night went differently. All right, so I will come back to a host of those questions. Yeah, later. yeah. Um, so let's just start with the, the long, strange journey that got you here. You were an undergrad at Northern Arizona University, the Lumberjacks. That's right. And you, you were an illustration major, is that right. right? Yeah. And did you, when you were there, did you know that you wanted to go into filmmaking? Yeah, I really did. They didn't have a film program, but um, you know, I, I would always try to get with my friends and sneak if somebody had a video camera or, or anything like that. And I love theater. I love getting actors together and... Uh, Getting uh, some kind of spectacle, whether it was uh, doing a you know a backyard concert with my garage band or or putting on elaborate uh, treasure hunts for my friends, it was just this whole kind of yearning to be part of something creative. And since there wasn't a film program, I did everything around it, you know, photography and and music and illustration and theater, um, all the elements that would eventually come together as a filmmaker. Yeah, and then you got your MFA in theater at CalArts? Yeah, I was a designer at CalArts, and okay. then there I, I took directing classes and took editing classes, and, and again, tried to sneak video equipment and, and make my own little shorts and things like that. And there were great actors at CalArts, so that was like my first introduction to what it was like to have talent you know, available for, for projects. Anybody in the in coherence that you knew from back in those days? Yeah, uh, Hugo, the big guy with the with the beard, is Cal Arts, and so is Amir, who uh, uh, co-wrote it with me, co co you know sort of co story um, wrote the story with me. Yeah, I saw Cal that Arts. the actress who played Lee also is a screenwriter. She wrote. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lorraine Scafaria, amazing yeah. uh, writer and a, and a great director in her own right. She's got a new movie out right now with Rose Byrne and um, Susan, Sarandon. Susan Sarandon, right. Is that a coincidence or did you? In the I met her on Rango. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. All right, great. So can you talk about the kind of the transition from an MFA in theater into, into Academy Award winning Rango? How did that happen? I just was driven to be in film somehow because you know when you grow up in Flagstaff, Arizona, you're a million miles away from from movies. I didn't know a single person who had even been on a movie set until I was 24, and I, I got to Cal Arts and, and there were creative people everywhere and there was equipment, but I wasn't in the film school, so everything was about strategizing how to get equipment, how to get editing time. Um, it's not like today where you know just having a phone is so much more equipment than we could ever get back then. So uh, yeah, I just spent every waking hour trying to figure out how to get closer and closer to filmmaking. And luckily this job existed called Storyboard Artist. And so after CalArts, I worked my ass off to get a storyboard portfolio ready that was professional looking. And I would do sort of my day life was storyboarding from Michael Bay and, and Gore Verbinski and Ben Stiller and people like that. And on the weekends and at night, I was doing my own independent projects with my friends and you know, making animated projects or making crazy um, uh, experimental film projects. Yeah, so the story idea came out of that for, for Rango? Um, I worked on all the Pirates of the Caribbean movies with Gore Verbinski okay. and, and all his movies, Mouse Hunt and, and The Ring. 
And so after the third Pirates, Gore was really craving to just make a movie from home. <laughs> and so we created Rango, we wrote Rango. And John Logan was the actual screenwriter, but we all kind of uh, wrote it together over, over a year or two. Yeah, and does he have a statue? Did he get to, who? who Gore gets, gets the statue gets for best statue. animated movie, yeah. Wow. Wow. There's only one. Yeah, bummer. So <laughs> did that open up uh, doors in terms of financing for coherence, or no, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, there, I, you know, we won the Academy Award, and I got so many phone calls from high school friends. Uh, but you know, it doesn't. It actually didn't open any doors at all. Oh, bummer. Yeah. So can you talk about then the process of coming off of that, and then how did how did you get this movie made, and talk, and you know, especially the the writing process. I, I was so tired of, of hearing no, because as a filmmaker, you're going to hear no every day, all day, every day. You go in with this great idea and you pitch it and, and they're just like, no, you know, you're not famous, no, or you're not related to someone famous. Um, your dad doesn't own a studio or, you know. Uh, so that they're just looking for any reason to say no, and after a while I was like, I don't feel like asking for permission anymore. Because I used to make film projects on my own. I used to do theater pieces on my own. You had a backyard band. I'm going to make a movie on my own. And these cameras are now great, and I know some actors, and I have a living room. So that's what I'm going to do. And it really came out of frustration trying to do it the established Hollywood way, which led to nothing and nothing and nothing. Um, it was great working on other people's movies. I mean, I actually really love working for Gore Verbinski and, and these other directors who have visions, but, you know, at the end of the day, that's their vision. And even though it's really fun, it's, there's still a million ideas in here that, that want to get out. And so it was really just um, stopping all that and saying, I, I don't need to ask for permission anymore. Yeah. I'm just going to call up some friends and start shooting a movie next week. Now, did, were, was that cast of friends already assembled, or did you go through a casting process where you said, okay, I, ha I know the actor who's going to play. It, it was just people that I knew I could call up and say, uh, look, I don't have a script. You're just, are you up for a challenge? There, there were people I'd worked with before okay. and, uh, or friends. Uh, Loreen, I didn't even, I'd never seen her act, but I just knew she was a genius and yeah. hilarious, so I just I took a chance on her. But yeah. I, I invited them over to do sort of a test because I, I had been directing commercials and things like that where most of the time you're sitting around, you're not actually filmmaking, you're waiting. You're waiting for lights to be moved around or you're waiting for actors to come out of trailers. And I would always fantasize like, wouldn't it be great to get rid of the crew and the script? The two things that are slowing me down. And so on this project, I thought, well, that's perfect. This, like, I can do this experiment I've always wanted to do. I was like, get rid of everybody and sort of give the actors just enough pieces of character so they, they have something to start with, but don't tell them what's going to happen. Did you hear, did, I don't know if you heard this in, um, in, when you were studying theater, but Shakespeare, did you hear this story? That Shakespeare, when he was directing like, his plays, would only give the actors their part on on pieces of parchment, apparently. So they on, they only were privy to their particular lines, right? So the right. they're able to be super in the moment because they don't know how the play is going to end, and that's really what's going on here, right? Yeah, right. I wanted to take it one step further. I didn't want them to have lines because I don't want an actor to be thinking like, "When's my turn to say my line?" I want them to be listening to everybody else and and you know be completely present for what everybody else is saying. And only then, if it sort of reminds them of something their character would say, are they then prompted to say it. Yeah. But you had the, the beats already meticulously structured. I knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Alex and I took a year of like really talking through all the twists and the turns. And is it two houses? Or is it three houses? Wait a minute. Wouldn't it be infinite houses? Or would it be a couple million houses? And, and what's all the logic, the internal logic of it? Um, so that was really clear, and we thought of it like a fun house, basically. When you go into a fun house, you go in, there's only one door in each room and one door out, but you can do whatever you want in the room, but the fun house itself is going to lead you on a very predetermined path. And so that's how this was done. There were scenes that 
started and we're going, I knew how they'd end, but I said, you can do whatever happens, happens. They didn't know the door was gonna knock. They didn't know the box was coming. They had no idea what the ping pong paddle was. They, they, they really had no idea what was in the box at all. They didn't know how it was gonna end. They didn't know what it was about. Uh, Lorene Scafaria thought it was a comedy because she heard, <laughs> she heard improv. She's like, oh, it's like an improv show. She, it took her like three nights. It was a five night shoot and after the third night, she's like, I don't think this is a comedy. <laughs> Emily didn't know she was the lead. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. Wow. I mean, how did it feel like there was that great line, one of the best lines in the film where Mike says, if there are a million alternate realities, yeah. I slept with your wife in every single one. How did okay. that feel? To okay. okay, it's 97% improvised. There's 3% that I said, kind of have to say this line. Yeah. Get to a place where you would say right. this line. And that was one of those. Yeah, yeah it's such a great line. Um, yeah, so the, the, yeah, there's like such an immediacy to their performances, I think. They're listening yeah. to each other. And if someone, if they don't hear it, they say, what? Like, explain that again. What are you saying? And, and it really forces you to uh, be clear, to be present, to be absolutely in the moment. Yeah. What's what, And I knew you directed shorts before that. Was the directing, pro how did that feel as a director to be in the middle of that kind of, almost like a, like a three ring circus? Yeah, and it's, it's terrifying. Really and also I'm shooting. So I'm holding oh, a camera and my DP Nick Sadler is holding a camera. There's no other crew wow. in, in the room. And so I'm, I'm you know, learn how to focus with one hand, hold the camera and focus with one hand while the other hand's like, go up through that door, you know, go tell you over there. Like, it was, it was really exhilarating and also like exhausting because most of it's very low angles. So I'm, I'm sort of, you know, on in these incredibly awkward stances that, that took weeks of yoga to, to fix. <laughs> um, but really, really exhilarating. And, and when it goes wrong, you're, you start getting real knots in your stomach, like, God, oh, this isn't right, but I don't want to interrupt them because I told them, you know, I gave them complete freedom. I said, you go anywhere in the house. We'll, we'll follow you. That's why it's so shaky. I'm actually not a big fan of the shaky cam look. But this, that's the only way that you could do this because we didn't rehearse it, we didn't block it, and we said, we will follow you. We'll go wherever you go. And the only way to be honest like that is to sort of give them that freedom. And so sometimes I'd, I'd be thinking like, they'll go down a track and I'd be thinking, this is not usable. This is just never gonna be in the, in the movie. But I told them they, they could you know, follow their instincts and so I'd have to just wait it out. <laughs> and they go, all right, why don't we go back to the table and this time don't let him leave. And we kind of do another version of yeah. it. Yeah, for film professors like us, it's like, oh, that's all very Cassavetes, right? Where you, where Cassavetes is letting the act, giving the actors freedom, and then trying to capture what he can on camera. Yeah. Were there other influences? Like, gosh, there was that '90s movie Anniversary Party. Do, did you oh, ever right. see that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were there other influences? That's painful. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, the influence honestly was this test I did to see if we could make editing sense out of a mess like this. When you put eight people around a table, it gets really confusing with eye lines and, and uh, uh, just the flow of, of conversation. And so we did a test to see if that would be a complete jumble. And, and it worked as, as long as I kind of had communication with my other camera and as long as we kept getting sort of uh, complimentary shots and we'd sort of circle around the table in, in specific ways and editing that together gave me ideas for then the, the feature movie. Wow. Yeah. So uh, how about the process of actually getting this out to audiences? What was your, what, what did you go through to, to decide we're gonna hit the festival circuit first? Um, yeah, we, well first of all, we didn't even know if we had a movie because it's, it's really a YouTube video. You know, it's, it's so <laughs> lo-fi um, that we would test it on a few, we, I'd invite people to my house and just show them the movie and say, does it even feel like a movie? And the first few audiences were instantly like, oh yeah, it's a movie. And they gave us suggestions of cutting things out and that monologue I told you about, like yeah. little, little trims here and there. So that was the first process. But because that went so well, we started getting very confident about it because we had, I think, three screenings in my living room and the audiences would walk out with just 
their minds blown and they wanted to talk about it. Yeah. That was the main thing. A lot of times you show a movie and people are like, that's great. Let me tell you about my film. <laughs> right. uh, so it's two guys and a monkey. <laughs> but in this, they just wanted to talk about the ideas in the movie. And, and that almost never happens. And so we knew we were onto something. And so we uh, sent it to, we, we actually did send it to Sundance. We knew it wouldn't get into Sundance. Uh, and, but it got into Fantastic Fest, and, and that was the one I wanted to be in, and yeah. so we premiered at Fantastic Fest. And did that lead to distribution out of that one? Yeah, I think okay. so. We got wow. uh, we sort of won Fantastic Fest in a way. We were sort of like the audience favorite, almost, and we won Best Screenplay, and so instantly just going to that film festival, we went from no one knowing about the movie to all the cool people knowing about the movie. Oh, okay. And it was instantly embraced by that crowd. And, and again, that just gave it this um, uh, instant propellant to the next level. And Oscilloscope then became our distributor. Okay, yeah. I mean, I saw, I, I was turned on to the film by a buddy, Matt Irvin, who had seen it on VOD, I think, one night. And he's like, you yeah. gotta check out this film. So I think, it, did it have a theatrical release? Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we, uh, that's one reason we went with Oscilloscope is because they said, yeah, we'll get you in Los Angeles and New York. Okay. We thought, that's amazing. A, a movie that we shot in our living room is going to be in theaters. Yeah. And it ended up being in 20 cities. Oh, wow. Yeah. And do you get the sense, I mean, it was, this was finished in 2013. Do you get the sense, like, is it starting to feel like it could be like one of those cult classic films that you know has has legs well beyond the release i have no idea but every week someone contacts me from somewhere in the world who's been touched by it or moved yeah. by it and so it, it does have that feeling of a long life yeah. and it's very gratifying and things like this you know just people still interested in it yeah i mean like i said the, one of the reasons i love it so much is because every time i watch it it feels like oh wait i didn't quite catch that the first time. That was our goal. Yeah. We said, can we make a movie that actually gets better the more times you yeah. watch it? Yeah, I definitely think that's the case. So do you feel like this has opened other doors? I know you're working on a sci-fi series with David Goyer who did yeah. Man Begins, right? It certainly gets you in the room. It doesn't mean anything. You have to have something to follow it up. But all of a sudden, I went from begging to get meetings to pitch to people seeking me out, saying someone at the studio saw your movie, they want to meet with you right away. Uh, so that's the, been the last year. It's like every week, two, three, sometimes 10, um, wow. people get a hold of me saying, we, we just want to talk to you. Wow, can you tell us a little bit about the series in development or just a little? Oh, the line? series, well, do you guys know who David Goyer is? He, he wrote Batman Begins and, and the latest Batman Superman movies and he wrote Blade. Dark City, he's amazing. Uh, he has a company that, he, he produces basically, he has a company called Phantom Four, and he saw the movie and he was one of the people that reached out to me and said, I just wanna, just wanna talk about what you wanna do next. Wow. And so we are developing a, a TV show that's a little, little sci-fi, little Twilight Zone-y, but he's a genius, so. Yeah, that's been great. great. So I'm gonna start throwing these questions at Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I'm gonna start first with uh, Brad Riddell had the question about the military advisor on film. There is a military advisor in the credits. He is my best friend. He is in the Marines and the reason he's in there, he emailed me from Iraq with a dream he had about finding a box under a house that had these impossible photographs from our youth in it. Oh wow. And it was so freaky uh, and it, sort of lodged in my head is like, I gotta do a story about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great, yeah. that's great. So I guess my first question would be, does Ping Pong Paddle M stay with us throughout the entire film? Am I still yeah. watching Ping Pong Paddle yeah. after that big melee in the bathroom? It's yeah. not like... Yeah, you're watching one Emily from, from the first shot to the last shot. Okay. Okay, um, good, that's good to know. That's the whole key to the story. Right, because otherwise, feels like, when does she get separated from the ping pong house? Is it when she goes to get the ring, or is it earlier when she's with like... A it's when the group of four travels oh. through the dark space to see the other house. Okay. Yeah. So she, 
so when she so when she comes back, is she with the right group of four? No. Oh man. Yeah, the right group of four. Right. Yeah, the when group she of four. comes back, it's still her and her boyfriend Kevin. Okay. Lori, her nemesis, and Mike. Okay. Though that's the only four from the original ping pong house. Right. But then Mike leaves. Yeah. To go blackmail himself. So when he comes back, he's no longer the Mike's right. the, the right Mike. So at the end, when Emily bails on her house, it's because it's only her and Kevin and Lori are the only ones that she's from the original house with. Right. And there's Kevin holding Lori yeah. and having this whole mess. And she just says, I I, I don't need any of this. Yeah. I don't need you guys and I don't belong in this house. I would rather take my chances out in the dark. Yeah. She looks in the window, right? It, it, she looks into a bunch of windows. Yeah. But she looks at one window. I don't know if you mean anything by this, but when she looks in one window where Kevin and Lori are kind of hugging yeah, each yeah. other. Yeah, they found each other. Yeah. So what happened there? Was that something where they... The night went differently and, and oh, they got wow, full on okay. together. Wow. And they're, they're confessing their love in that scene. And it's all those were so fun because, you know, we yeah. have only got five or six minutes to shoot each of those. And I'd say, okay, in this one... You guys are together, you're announcing your love to the group, and if you can't hear it as well on this uh, screening tonight, but sometimes you can hear Amir, Amir crying and going, you told me she was crazy! <laughs> <laughs> you told me! And the others are trying to calm him down, and it's okay, it's okay. Wow. So, do you think that Mike is right when he says that all the branching started that night. Yeah. So none of that, none of the, none of the previous uh, alternate reality people could have come from that night before that. In, night. in our original intention, yeah. yes. There's other people with their own theories that I yeah. allow them to have those theories, and if that sounds better to you, then that's absolutely fine. But in our uh, t intention, it starts in that first shot where she's talking to Kevin and Got her it. phone breaks. Okay. So I've been dying, We've I've had class discussions where we talk about this for probably about a good half an hour. Yeah. What is, why is Lori grilling Mike about the Roswell show? Now is there, a, is she from a reality where she never saw Mike and Mike was never on Roswell or is she just like smoking crack just for that? There are I, you know, two, right? there are two possible answers to this, one is the filmmakers are just messing with right, you. Right, right. Uh, the other one is you are actually, as an audience, watching a film from a different, slightly different reality where he he did not get on Buffy. And first of all, his name is not Nicholas Brendan, so he's not playing himself, yeah, by the way. Yeah. So, but. Yes, the feeling, we just realized it would be very fun in a detail like that to not mirror reality perfectly, but to imply that this whole movie might be from a different branch. Okay, now you're gonna have to back that up. We, the audience, are watching a movie from a different reality. Right. Right, okay. So yeah, so it does fit in my whole Berenstain Bears theory. Mm -hmm. you, we, we talked that about that similar. earlier, right? Yeah. Similar, right? Okay, that's that's good to know. Yeah. Um, I am gonna, I think, then open up to the audience for questions. Can I do that? Now that we're on the topic, you're welcome of to questions. ask questions if you have questions, about, or we can just wing it over here. Yeah. Questions about. Oh, and we have microphones here. Yeah. Please come to the mic and ask your. Or can you pass the mic around? It's on camera. Oh. Yeah. Now they're not going to do it. Yeah, please, question, anything, anything. Hi. Enjoyed the movie a lot. Oh, great. Uh, I had a question about uh, your theme, possibly, or if that had anything to do with your choice to uh, make the whole movie improvisation. <laughs> Like anything to do with like the random universes and random yeah. speech. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it wasn't everything, but it was definitely from the beginning. As we were talking about it, we we're saying, look, it's perfectly in line with the theme, which is that we don't have a script. The slightest difference in what an actor says is going to spin it off in a completely different branch. Yeah. Gotcha. And it did. I mean, we have so many hours of footage of paths that they went down that did not make it into the film. Great yeah. question. 
What's everybody doing back there? That looks very interesting. Uh, uh, first, just want to say I love the film. Thank Incredible. You. Thank you. Um, but also going back to the dinner party, uh, when they're all at the table, and he, she mentions the comet that, or uh, someone else mentions the comet at, that happened in 1933, and she corrects him saying it was 1923. Right. Was that your way of also messing with us? Like as a continuation? Not really. That was more like to show that she was the one at the table who had really boned up on Wikipedia that day and was ready with the information. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm not sure how much. Uh, <laughs> You might be able to help me. Uh, but I'm making a similar film in that it's a sci-fi and it takes place in one room. Not similar at all to your film. But I was just wondering how you tackled the challenge of... Obviously, it was helped a little bit by your story and the way it's done. How you tackled the challenge of keeping tension in that the whole film basically, for the most part, takes place in one room? A great question. And I thought about that, too. And, and one of the first things you think of doing is saying, oh, well, is that our conceit then? It's a movie shot in one room. Like saying, it's a movie shot it all in one shot. And I thought about it, and I thought, no, I don't, I'm not actually going to do that. If they need to go outside, and it would make sense for the camera to go outside, I'm going to go outside with them. And so just having that freedom to not be bound by the four walls of the room really opened it up and, and felt right. Um, the other thing we did is it's shot very close because we realized all the, all the medium and wide shots started making it feel like a play. And it really helped sort of getting in tight and so you weren't sure what part of the room you were in a lot of times. And it actually felt more cinematic, limiting the amount of room that you saw. Because imagine this film shot all in wide shots. It would feel like an episode of Friends. Mm -hmm. You know, it would feel like you see the room always, and you always know where the couch is. You always know where the kitchen is. And so I don't know if that helped you in a very specific way, but that helped us a lot. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That does help. Yeah. Did you do pickups to get any insert shots? We did. Yeah. Six months later, we came back uh, and really had to fill in holes. And that was the one thing, I should say, that saved me in the in the stress of those five days, I had to really remind myself, it's okay. Like, if I'm missing something, I'll come back sure, and pick yeah. it up. Because otherwise, it would have been so stressful wondering. Because I'm not even seeing the other camera. So I don't, I don't even know what yeah. my other cameraman's getting. But I just reminded myself, it's, I can come back. I can get that shot if I've missed it. Yeah, and you shot in your house, so you had access yeah, to location. Yeah, and we made the most of that. The only problem was six months later, Lorreen Scafaria had changed her hair, so we spent as much on a wig as the entire first shoot cost. Oh, no. We had to track down an amazing wig. It was Jennifer Lopez's wig. Get it <laughs> styled to match her hair, get these expert wig makers and wig fitters in just to make sure that she looked like herself. Wow, can you say how much it cost? That wig was $8,000. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So because you guys should feel it's bad gonna, about pickups that cost. Yeah, and otherwise <laughs> wigs you. will look fake if you don't spend that kind of money. And she, there's shots of her right next to each other, you know, edited together, wig, no wig, wig, no wig. And you can't mess around with that. You have to pay for the, re the real thing. Wow. Um, first of all, uh, it was a really fun movie to watch. I can't wait to, can't wait to see it again. Oh, good. It's going to be, I'm, I'm sure, better the second time. That's great. Um, so my question is, uh, you, as a sci-fi film, you said you're starting a sci-fi series. Um, I just want to know what some of your sci-fi influences were, if you have. Oh, yeah. I loved Ray Bradbury a, a lot. Um, I loved uh, Arthur C. Clarke when I was a kid. You know, I liked Star Wars like all 10-year-old boys loved it, but when I saw 2001, that's what really kind of made my brain go, oh, this is what science fiction can be. So then that led me to read Arthur C. Clarke and Rendezvous with Rama and Childhood's End and, and the novel version of 2001. And then that led me to re just reading the anthologies of, of short stories and things from art from writers in the 60s and 70s. And, Twilight Zone, of course, big influence, yeah. Do you ever get grilled on the science? Like, do people say, hey, 
do quantum physicists ever come to you? Yeah, and, say, do, do and I have to remind them, like, th there's no science in this movie. <laughs> this is a fantasy. That's why we say it's a comet, yeah. okay? Like, <laughs> this does not pretend. This actually technically is not a science fiction movie, even. Sci science fiction, by a strict definition, postulates a scientific advancement and says, okay, what would result from that? That's not happening in here. This is a fantastical occurrence with a comet, which is magic, uh, th that is glossed over by them thinking they've found a, an explanation in the Schrodinger's cat of it, but that doesn't explain anything. That's just, that's them getting worked up. The, the, the actors are, and the characters so craving a, an explanation for it that they think that that's the answer, but it's not. So as a writer, you don't actually think the whole Schrodinger's cat and decoherence and coherence is an accurate description of the universe that you are creating? I, it is, but it's not this movie. That it's, not, um, it's not an accurate portrayal of, of that concept if you were to be very, very strict yeah. with it. Yeah. yeah, cool. This is a character movie. Yeah. Hi, I was wondering with so much of your process being about improvisation and kind of leaving it to chance and, and randomness, how you uh, approach the music with your composer and whether or not there was a lot of direction given or kind of limits in terms of the direction they were going and also maybe the kind of direction in terms of pacing for specific scenes or musical climaxes. Yeah, I got very lucky with my composer. Uh, uh, she was... A, or she is a commercial uh, composer. She works on big commercials, but she's an independent, she's like an indie artist. She's kind of like me with her day job and then her passion. And she, um, uh, Kristen Dyrud, she had the ability to create these soundscapes out of crazy things. You know, she'd, she'd clang two things together and then just use that as the, the raw material then to create an entire sort of sound design slash score, there's not a lot of melody going on in there. And that's what we talked about. We said, this is really more living sound design. And there's almost an hour of original music going on in there. So it's all that sort of weird uh, tonal Brian Eno stuff going on. And then once or twice I said, now it has to become a song. Like when she goes out walking for the comet, I said, that really needs to feel like a song is now kicked in. So. A lot of direction, but also she gave me such great stuff that I just said, keep going. Whatever you're doing, just keep doing that. So I only step in. It, it is similar. Like with the actors, I only step in if it's sort of going in the wrong direction. But if it's going the right direction, I just try to encourage it and, and allow them to keep going. Great. Thank you. Thanks. I am just Thanks. curious, can you talk a little bit more about your writing process and how you developed this, the core story that you took to these actors to improvise? Yeah, I, I, again, I did this test a year earlier where it was just basically a kind of a version of the first act where uh, they gather for dinner, a box shows up. It was a little bit different. It was only two photographs um, because I had that idea of the two notes. I thought, wouldn't that be interesting if you're, you're just intent on writing a note and getting it to the other house, but then you open the door and there's another note. And that was the whole idea. That's, that's enough for a short. And, but then that test went so well, I just knew I, I have to figure out what would happen next. Yeah. What, how would the night go now? And I kind of knew it was about people being in conflict with themselves. I knew it was about choices that the lead girl had made that would come back to her. So. I just really thought about it from the direction of, all right, if I know this is where it starts, what, what would happen if it started getting messier and messier? And I discovered this word decoherence, which is all about the, you know, why things don't seem to be happening at the same time. And I thought, well, that's interesting. If decoherence is the thing that keeps these branches separately, then the opposite of that would be coherence. Well, that's a pretty good title and a pretty good theme. So if it's called coherence, then I need to make it about two-thirds of the way into the movie and make it absolute spaghetti. Yeah. 
how can I make it so twisted and incomprehensible that it lives up to the irony of the title, I guess. And then I thought, all right, if you make a mess two thirds of the way in, you have to leave the audience out because I don't want to leave the audience in that feeling of a complete mess. And I thought, well, the only way to do that then is to focus in on that one character and have it be more and more about that one character's choice. So by the end, it's just this tiny little thread of did she get away with it or not? Yeah. Was that an, you talked about the monologue that you cut, was that part of the, when you're talking, when the, no. the theme? The that monologue was, that was cut was a mirror saying, we're not at war with the house down the, down the road. And he actually had a much longer monologue about like traveling to the Middle East and seeing people who, you know, his people that were uh, in conflict with each other because Amir, his backstory is he's kind of this mishmash of all these different um, races that are in conflict with each other. And, and his, his uh, sort of epiphany was that we're all the same. Why are we in conflict with each other? If we're all literally the same people. We're only afraid of each other because we're, we're transposing all of our fears of ourselves onto each other. There's no reason for conflict. We are literally the same people. And I love that. I was like, that's what the movie is about. And he did this monologue, and people are like, you don't need that. <laughs> God, yeah, that, that's, yeah. Bo that's boring. So I was like, no, it's my theme. <laughs> so before, our, I'm going to make our screenwriting professors stay up there for a little bit. So I love the red herring scene, which I think is a red herring, right, where they're talking about the, the ketamine. Oh, where, yeah, yeah. where they're, tr you know, was that script, was that whole, where, did you script that as a kind of red herring? Where you're like, yeah, yeah. okay, I want them to go down the yeah, very ketamine specific. alley. Because you're while. supposed to be questioning, it, it does two purposes. It has to set up the ketamine for the end, so she has a mechanism to take out the other Emily. Um, but also to make the audience question, like, okay, so w how much of this is real? Maybe they are, maybe they are on drugs. It also gets them out of the living room. They have to go to the kitchen because you have to, sort of clear everyone out of the living room so that Hugh and Amir can gather up everything and get out of there. So the ketamine was doing like triple, quadruple duty, plot, theme, all of these, all of these uh, uh, jobs that the ketamine had to do. And so, uh, again, the, the actors weren't aware of all that, but I knew like that had to happen. You're gonna have to question her on the ketamine, you're gonna have to go to the kitchen. And they're hilarious when they're like dropping the, and there's ketamine, <laughs> like the little jokes about the ketamine. It's yeah. so funny. Bradley. So um, thanks again, Jim. Um, Thank you. The, uh, you know, maybe Ron, you can help me with this. Was it Rodriguez who always said cut to the dog, like shoot the, shoot the dog, like a, sh a shot of the dog, to have a cutaway? Was it? I don't know if it was Rodriguez. Oh, no. Uh, no, I don't know. Well, I just noticed that there was this candle that sometimes he would go to. <laughs> I, I get because nothing was happening with the candle, but it just seemed like, as a transitional point, I need to get out of this shot to this shot, and that led me to wondering about post and data management and like, yeah, yeah. you know, you're shooting five day or five nights, and you probably you said you could have made multiple movies out of all yeah. this footage. So how did you a manage all that data and keep the process rolling without long stops? And then how did you also manage post for this? The editing process is everything. Th this movie, if you watch it a few times, you, you will see how, what a remarkable editing job this is. And and I knew from the beginning that it would be made in the in the editing. And so all of the post money, I actually raised money for post. I actually once I had a version of the movie, I could show it to people and say this is. This is working, can I get money? And I used almost all of it for a great editor, Lance Pereira, who I just, I knew he would make something great of it, out of it. And it was just pounding it and pounding it again. And then we do a version of a scene and then go looking through every other scene and see if there was something usable in unrelated scenes. And, and all the time we'd find a, a reaction shot or a whole line and we'd start bashing pieces together. So what you're seeing looks like it's all one coherent thing, but it's really you're seeing scenes that are bashed together from all five nights to make what we needed it to be. Um, and that was worth everything. I mean, getting a great editor is, is, is gold. Um, and we just took a lot extra time. You know, normally you'd edit it in a month probably and we took four months. And we kept testing it on audiences, of course. So I, I guess the answer is just a, a, a lot of extra work. Yeah. 
you don't have a script. You know, normally you'd have a script and you'd have four takes of of each setup, and you go, okay, in this in this script in this scene, he's supposed to say, Emily, sit down, and you look at your options. You've got a wide shot. You've got four versions of the close up. We didn't have any of that. We didn't have any of that. We said, okay, what do we got? Well, we have this big mishmash of of a possibility. Maybe we try this, and we just started trying things until it started forming into something coherent. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> wow. What's your shooting ratio? Like, uh, how much, how many minutes of raw footage do you think you had compared to? The camera was rolling almost the whole time, and and we. We shot about five hours each night. The actors would come at six and leave at 11. So probably four to five hours of, of footage each night. So 25, 24 hours probably 24 footage hours. to make an yeah, so hour and a half movie. Wow. So um, I just wanted to ask about your lighting because I know you know you shot most of it in your living room, but the shots outside, you know, the dark point, um, you know, what did your you know, you're running outside with your camera. What did your neighbors think? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, how did you even get that one dark spot? That really, really, you know, dark spot with is there no uh, street lamps? Or yeah, anything? good question. And this is our last question. I'm being told. Um, so th that was very tricky. We uh, there's so many parts of that. Like the night we were supposed to shoot outside in my neighborhood happened to be the one night that a real shoot was happening on our street. A Snickers commercial oh, had wow. come to town, <laughs> taken over the whole street, had these huge lights, these huge cranes, the whole thing was lit up. There was a horse trailer parked out in front of my house with horses. There were little people dressed up like uh, <laughs> Halloween characters. There were 200 <laughs> kids. It was this huge Halloween commercial destroying our, the whole point was supposed to be like nobody is visible on the street. So we, what you're actually seeing are these little slivers of darkness between those. Like if we would turn the camera four inches to the right, you would see a horse trailer and a bunch, and the craft service truck. Or if we go to the left, you'd see a gigantic camera crane. So we just had to find these little dark cracks to shoot those in. It was a nightmare. There's a Kurosawa story actually where they say, Master Kurosawa, why did you, how did you come up with this framing? And he's like, well, to the left there was a school, and to the right there's a factory. Yeah. So it's very, very similar. It, the whole, I guess, the whole concept is make the most of what you've got. You know, find a way to make it work. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. That is our last question. Yeah. I'm happy to answer more if you want to, uh, you know, grab me out the door or anything. I love. I can talk about this all night. So. Thank you very much. It's Thank been a, you. A real, real treat for me personally. I really appreciate it.